literal monster trucks, ACDC, and Lisa Simpson. I'm not saying a bunch of random words. This is Maximum Overdrive. Maximum Overdrive is a 1986 sci-fi horror film written and directed by Stephen King. This was his first and last time that he directed a movie, and that was for a pretty good reason. Throughout the entire shoot, he was high as a kite on cocaine, and that really comes through when you watch the movie. Stephen King himself calls this the worst adaptation of any of his books ever made, but I definitely do not agree with that. The film stars Emilio Estevez. <laughs> yes. Emilio Estevez at his peak 80s stardom. This movie came out right after The Outsiders, St. Elmo's Fire, and The Breakfast Club, so he was a huge star at the time. Now, of course, his film career did fizzle out by the mid to late 90s, but he did go on to be a really great director. For better or for worse, the film also stars Yardley Smith, aka the voice of Lisa Simpson. Emilio's co-star is Laura Harrington, who was getting to be a big star at the time. There are two pretty great cameos in this film. One is by Stephen King himself, and the other is Giancarlo Esposito as the young man. You'll remember Giancarlo Esposito as Gus from Breaking Bad. In this film, the Earth has passed through the tail of a comet. Naturally, this causes all the electronics, appliances, cars, trucks, and more to become homicidal sentient murder machines. So a ragtag, plucky group of survivors band together to fight off these evil machines. Unfortunately, the Earth is going to be passing through this comet's tail for eight days. So when I talk about movies, I talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly. So let's get to the good. The movie really opens with a bang. It lets you know what you are in for and what to expect for the rest of the film. Part of what makes that intro and really the rest of the movie so great is the music. The entire score, the entire soundtrack is done by ACDC. Every single bit of music in this film is ACDC. And that's because at the time that was Stephen King's favorite band. He even asked them to make an appearance in the movie as themselves, but they declined. Another fun tidbit is the fact that he wanted Bruce Springsteen to be the lead actor in the film. He really fought hard for that, but of course he ended up losing to the studio because they wanted an actual actor. One of the things that I love about this movie, and a lot of people might put this into the bad category, but I put it into the good, is the overacting. It is on like a Nicolas Cage level, but not like one or two people. Pretty much the whole cast is overacting throughout the entirety of the film. It can be something really small, nothing important or stressful, but there's somebody in that scene at any given time who is overacting like crazy. This being a horror film, the deaths in the movie are a mixed bag. Some of them are pretty awesome. They're pretty gruesome and pretty dark. Some of them are a little weird, and some of them just left me scratching my head. This being a Stephen King film, it's definitely filled with some of his favorite tropes, like the religious hypocrite who gets what he deserves, or the broken lead with a past that you don't know a lot about, or badass children who help to save the day. There are some genuinely cool moments and shots in this film that show Stephen King had talent behind the camera, and I think if he would have pursued it, he definitely could have made a name for himself in directing, not just in writing horror fiction. But because he was coked out of his mind and he was very stressed throughout the entirety of the shoot, he quit directing after this his first and only feature film. Something that I thought was pretty great and super convenient is the fact that the diner that everyone is holed up in trying to survive is built over the top of a cellar that is filled with machine guns and bazookas, every kind of weapon you can imagine. And they never explain why. Not once in the entire movie do they say, all these weapons are here because of this. Obviously, the owner of the diner has them, but why? Who is he selling the weapons to? What are they for? There are some genuinely cool tension-building moments in this film, and I think that speaks to Stephen King's talent of telling really scary stories. And that's even with the music in these scenes being ACDC's music. Now, they're stripped-down versions, so they actually do work most of the time in these tension building scenes. And there are some genuinely interesting set pieces and shots and pretty iconic moments in this film that still stick out in my head from the time that I saw this as a kid in the 1980s. Especially in the first act when it's like one or two characters alone, whether it be the kid on the bike or the annoying couple, and they're all trying to make their way to this diner to survive. There are some really cool things in there, like I said, that I still remember from when I was a kid. And that definitely includes the vehicles. Some of these vehicles have become so iconic that they have their own models and toys and stuff. As well as some of the scenes of death in the film, you don't see these kills, but the way that they're set up and shot really makes you wonder, how did that happen? This being a mid 80s film, there was no CGI at the time. So all of the effects in the film are done with practical effects. 
They look great. Everything from vehicles driving themselves around, you know, you see a tow truck, a steamroller, an ice cream truck. And obviously that was done by remote control, but there are some scenes where there are so many vehicles, there's no way that they were all controlled remotely. So they actually had drivers driving these vehicles around and I looked really hard, but you can't see the drivers in these vehicles. This movie is going to make you laugh a lot. It's really, really funny. A lot of the times I think it's unintentionally hilarious. It's not very self-aware. It takes itself serious for most of the film, but I think it really adds to the charm of the movie. And because the film revolves around killer machinery, there is a ton of amazing vehicular destruction and explosions. And because of the era that this movie was filmed in, it is packed to the brim with amazing 80s cheese. So with all that good out of the way, let's talk about the bad. <laughs> The editing, ho oh, ho the editing in this movie is on another level. Now, me being a film editor, I really appreciate good editing, and this movie has it in spades. And when I say amazing editing, I mean absolutely horrible. Shit that makes no sense whatsoever. At one point, the kid is being chased by a bunch of machines and it cuts so abruptly that you're just sitting there kind of surprised especially the fact that it cuts to people sitting down in the diner talking about the Bible and it never goes back to the kid. So you don't know how that scene ended. Yeah, sure. You might see him later or whatever, but okay. How did he get away? You know, what happened? Was he able to defeat the machines, whatever? And there are a lot of cuts in this movie that happen like that. Two words, Yardley Smith. It's AKA the voice of Lisa Simpson. When it comes to voice acting in cartoons, she's amazing. When it comes to acting, she's still pretty good. But in this film, she is so annoying. Like every time she says something, it's just nails on a chalkboard. Now that was the point of her character. She's supposed to be annoying. But by the end of the first act in the film, you're just wishing that she would just shut up. Speaking of characters, every character in this movie is extremely one dimensional. The first thing you see about that character is pretty much all you're going to know know about that character which is weird because it was written by Stephen King and he's usually pretty great at building characters and that's another thing that I can't really figure out about this movie and Stephen King's direction is the performances he got out of the actors Emilio Estevez can be a talented actor when he wants to be Laura Harrington can be a good actor when she wants to be but in this film they are both horrendous they are so bad they're so bad in fact that Emilio Estevez won the Razzie for worst actor in a movie that year. As much as I love ACDC, I do love ACDC. They are awesome. I've loved them since I was a kid. I would have loved to have had some orchestral music in this movie as well. I get that the theme is ACDC, so maybe the orchestral music would have thrown the balance off, but still orchestral music can really help with tension building and you know swells and stingers for scares. And that reminds me, the music for when people are getting killed is really weird. It's like uh, a guitar ripoff version of Psycho. <laughs> And sometimes it just really distracts from those kills. You're just thinking like, why is that music happening? Now there are a lot of dumb decisions made in this movie to further the plot, but honestly, I think in this movie, it makes sense. Something like Train to Busan, it definitely does not make sense. But in this one, even though it was annoying, I guess it worked. But some things were just too stupid to ignore. There's one point where they're being attacked and all of these people are just standing around and you see them getting killed little by little. And you're just wondering like, why won't you just duck or sit down or lay on the floor and you won't get killed. This movie loves to treat the audience like they are dumb as hell. I think eight different times in the film, various characters talk about the reason this is happening. Oh, it's because of the comet. Ooh, we're going through the comet's tail. The comet's gonna be here for eight days. Dude, we get it. You don't have to keep telling us that the reason the machines can now think for some reason is the fact that we're going through the tail of a comet. This being a rated R horror film in the 80s, they definitely should have done a lot more with the gore. When they do use it, it's pretty nice. <laughs> They could have made it a lot more fun and a lot more gory, a lot more violent. Speaking of deaths, there are some deaths in here that involve a little bit of animation, but the animation is really, really bad. It's like hand drawn on the frames and stuff, but not in a good way. Like it looks like cartoons, like literal animation. At one point, one of the characters gets electrocuted. And as the electricity is going through them, you see it. And I just was waiting for like the outline of a skeleton to show because 
it was that cartoonish. At one point in the film, a couple of machines show a bit more intelligence than the others had so far. I really would have liked to have seen that explored further. Show the machines making some plans. Show them executing some strategies or whatever. For the most part, they just acted like really bad video game AI. They see the enemy and they drive right towards them. And that's it. They're really easy to outsmart. While most of the practical effects were really great, some of them are done pretty crappily. At one point, there's some people being shot and the squib work is just horrendous. You see like this big rectangle under their shirt and you see the, the squibs exploding and it looks very obvious and you're just sitting there like, man, that looks so fake. And it pulls you out of the film. Speaking of pulling you out of the film, the chemistry between Emilio Estevez and Laura Harrington's character is non-existent. They are by far one of the worst on-screen couples that I have ever seen. That's not an exaggeration. Just the conversations and the way they interact with one another, it's really bad. And I think a lot of that has to do with their performances. While I was watching the film, I couldn't help but think like, this is how someone would act if they just woke up from a coma and then smoked a joint or whatever. They're just really flat and tired and lethargic. I mean, some of the line delivery and the interactions they have with each other, you can tell it was super rehearsed. They weren't putting any feeling into it. It's just like, oh wow, you're such a rebel. Thank you. It's just really dumb. At the very beginning and at the very end of the film, there's this text-based exposition that's just plastered on the screen and it's very distracting like the one at the beginning you're just sitting there like okay i read it why is it still there the text at the very ending of the movie kind of actually ruined the ending and that's because it's covering the screen you don't see what's happening behind it but the biggest offender to any viewer in this film is going to be the logic Yes, it's a horror movie and the premise is really dumb and it's supposed to be good fun. And it is. But there are some things that you see where you're just like, come on, man. In this movie, trucks. Trucks are killing everyone. They're running people over. They're doing all kinds of stuff. But cars. No car in this film ever tries to hurt anyone. At one point, there are people driving in a car and a truck is trying to attack them. Like, why isn't the car helping? It's a machine. At another point in the film, you see a dog that is on the ground dead with a remote-controlled police car smashed into its mouth. Like, how did that remote control get there? Was the dog already laying down and it drove into it? Because obviously the car can't jump up three feet in the air and smash into the dog's mouth. Not only that, how much force would it require to smash into that dog's mouth and split its jaws open? You see a ton of people strangled by Walkmans. Yes, Walkmans, because remember, this is the 80s. How did that happen? There's no parts in there that can make it move. It's just a cable. So not only do the machines have intelligence now and they want to kill people for some reason, but something that's physically impossible to exert any force has the ability to strangle people. How does an 18-wheeler or a Walkman or at one point an electric knife have these thoughts? They don't have brains. They have nothing that makes them capable of thinking. So how does an electric knife know that it wants to make it across the counter and try to kill someone? It's just an electric knife. Yes, I know it's a big, dumb, fun movie and I'm not supposed to think too much about it, but you can only hold that suspension of disbelief for so long when you see weird stuff like that on the screen. Overall, this movie is a hot mess. It is a big steaming pile of shit. It is just horrible, but it is fantastic. It is great. It's fun to watch. I think it's something if you watch it with a group of friends, especially if you're at like a party or something, it could be a lot of fun. As fun as this movie is, I do have to be realistic with my score. So drum roll, please. Four out of 10.